But uh, today's a fun day. We're, we're, we're finishing up our series that this is kind of a sub-series of what we've been doing since the second week of the year. And we are, um, we're, we're looking at the life of David, and we've been looking at the life of Saul a little bit, and we're finishing up the life of David. And, and as we finish him, we've been looking the last five weeks, looking at him tell his story through the Psalms. And the one that we come to this morning is one where David is at the very end. And as David is at the very end of his life, he's reflecting on all of the things that God has done for him, and he 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 pens this really beautiful psalm. And it got me thinking, kind of like, um, just I was talking to someone at at my connect group this last week, and talking about their like their retirement dreams. And so I thought, you know, be fun since this is kind of like the end of David's life, kind of his retirement. Like, what are some of like our retirement dreams? And so we have a group on Facebook. It's called New Life Community Life. If you're not in it, you should be, and you can respond to stuff like this, and we'll, we might put your response on the screen. Um, and these, we got a lot of responses. So like in 20 minutes, I think we had like 25 responses to this question in the group, and most of them were what you would expect, okay? Like, I'd like to travel. I'd like to get an RV, yada, like the kind of things you would expect with retirement. There were a few that weren't, and those are the ones that we went with. And so these are a few of my favorite ones that we got from the... Um, from retirement dreams and our new life community life. The first one's from Matt Patey, and he's just kind of setting the stage. I think it makes a lot of sense. kind of almost feels a little bit like David. He said, mine is to live long enough to make it into retirement. I don't know what he's doing to make him think he isn't going to get there, um, but I, just something to think about there. Like that is, it's actually kind of dark if you think about it. <laughs> but okay, so that, that, that's Matt. Okay, then there, there are two that are along the same vein, but um, this next one is, uh, is from, from Abigail Wisnott. She said, so she said she wants to own 10 dogs. Now, that sounds like hell to me, okay? I just want to be honest with you. Like, me and 10 dogs, like, all the other stuff's great. Like, write a book, never do laundry. Yeah, I'm with you there, but own 10 dogs? Like, think of all, like, think of your backyard. Like, you ain't never going back there. And if you do, your shoes are going to be disgusting. So, like, I just think, like, that's not something I would want to do, but whatever, that's for you, Abigail. I have... Pray, I don't know. Um, and then this one's kind of along those lines. Rachel, Rachel Rice says, probably nothing too extraordinary. I like setting the bar low. I lo- like, you know when the bar is set low, it's, you can exceed it. Uh, but there will be at least 10 cats involved or more. Again, I just think that, like, that house is going to have a smell to it, you know? <laughs> and it's a smell that I don't want to smell. And, and maybe my husband, too. Like, sorry, Chad. Like, I don't know. Like, that's... Uh, Maybe. He might be there, but the cats will definitely be there, so I don't know. I don't know. Okay, then this, this next one is the, the most interesting retirement dream I've ever seen in my whole life. Michael Troutman and I want to buy an RV. I'm tracking and travel the country, still tracking, visiting every Walmart, like, okay, they're starting to turn off, looking for WWE action figures. I mean, like, how many different John Cena's do you need? Like, I don't know. But, like, I, I, I don't know. Like, all these are great. That's the one that I hope happens. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I, I want that for them. Okay, this, this, this last one is really, like, I love Mark, okay? <laughs> His retirement dream is to be done with puberty. To finally be done with puberty. Now, Okay, so like, here's what I love about Mark. He posted it, and he realized that context would help a lot. Now, there's two things you can do. You can delete it, and then repost it with the context that you think it deserves, or you can do what Mark did. 
And he just added a comment to give context, so I will give it to you. I should clarify, I mean for my children to be done with puberty. Me giving that clarifying comment in this setting, there's a word for it, it's called grace. Okay, I didn't have to do that, but I did it for Mark because I love him. Um, And I'm glad that I th- I th- I'm, I'm glad I think I can say that you're done with, with puberty. But um, Okay, so the psalm that we get to today, it's Psalm 18. And it's at the end of David's life, and he's looking at the end of his life, reflecting on it, basically just celebrating how good God has been to him. And, and, and as I was reading the psalm, and I was you know, kind of knowing that it was coming, I, there are parts of the psalm that are, like when you know everything about David, that are, are really difficult to to deal with when you know all of David's backstory. And, and as I was, and even as I was kind of just thinking about this, I'm like, man, how am I gonna, how am I gonna do that? Like, cause it just, it seems disingenuous to some of the things that he's done. It seems disingenuous to reality. And, and I found this quote from John Calvin that really helped me as I, as I prepared this. And, it, and he said this, he says that this Psalm, Psalm 18, it, it agrees far better with Jesus than it does with David. And if you think of it in those terms, the psalm actually is a really beautiful thing for us in, in the New Testament, New Covenant believers, because the, it shows us some, some incredible realities that are available to us in the gospel. And, and so that's kind of how I want to frame the message this morning, is I want to look at, through this psalm, look at some beautiful realities that are available to us in Christ. And then we'll start in verse one. Now the psalm has 50 verses, so I won't read all of them. I'll kind of jump around at some point. So if you see that, you can read the rest of them when you're home. But uh, Psalm 18, verse one, says this, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me, and the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and to my God I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry reached to him. It reached his ears. The first thing we see here as we look at this psalm is we see that Jesus is the source of our salvation. That as we consider the gospel, as we consider what this is showing us about Jesus, one of the things that it's showing us is it's showing us that the source, that our salvation, it comes from, from Jesus. Even if you look at the the, the psalm where it says the horn of salvation, that, that what it's talking about there, that it's talking about the altar in the Old Testament. And, and that was where Jew, Jewish, Jewish people believed that, that salvation came from. So what, what David is saying, talking about God, is he's saying that God, you are the source of my salvation, that Jesus is where our salvation comes from. And, and as I think about David's story, especially presented in the first few verses that we just looked at, that, that it is the story of every person who has put their faith in Christ. That David is saying, I was confronted with the reality of my death. And as I was confronted with it, I looked to God and God saved me. And if you're here in this room and you're, and you're a follower of Jesus, at some point, this, th- that, that's why. <clears throat> at some point, there was a moment in your life where you thought, I've I, I got to stop thinking in terms of just this life, but I need to start thinking about my eternity. That I, I've got to stop thinking about, about all the things that I can just see and maybe, just maybe there's something beyond this life and that's, that's where I want to go. And this, this psalm, it shows us that, that when you come to that reality and you look to God for hope, that God brings you hope. 
that what we have here that, that David doesn't is we have someone who our faith is in the fact that he conquered death. That part of what we believe when we think about the gospel is when we think about death, that, that Jesus, he died and he rose. So that when we put our faith in him and what he's done, that we believe that our fate will be the same when we're confronted by death. That, that we, we can call out to him in our distress and know that he'll be able to save us from something that no one else can. Now, I don't know that that's what David's thinking about. We, I, we don't really know. I, I think that what David's probably thinking about is he's thinking about his life. And, and David's story is very interesting. Like, when he talks about being close to death, I mean, he's got to be thinking about all kinds of things. Like, David's story, like, he, he went from, like, he was born a shepherd, and he died a king. Like, that, that's quite the meteoric rise, if you think about it. That as he thinks about the ways that God helped him and the ways that God saved him, he's probably thinking about the fact that, that, there, was a, that there was a moment in his life where he went toe-to-toe with Goliath, and he defeated him. As he's thinking about the ways that God delivered him, he's also probably thinking about the fact that there was a season where the king of Israel wanted to kill him and every time God spared him. Amen. He's probably thinking about the fact that there was, there was a time where he had to leave Israel and seek asylum amongst Israel's enemies and God protected him while he was there. That he's probably thinking about the fact that when he became king, Israel was surrounded by enemies. And even though they were surrounded by enemies, God gave them victory. But he's probably also thinking about the weight of his sin and the things that he had done and the fact that even though he has done the things that he has done, God is still willing to save him. That this is his story. And if that's your story, what else can you say other than the fact that God saved me? Like, you'd have to be pretty arrogant to look at David's story and think that, that a person could do that. But it's only by the grace of God that he could experience what he experienced. And I love the way that, that David talks about his challenges there. He talks about the cords of death, the cords of Sheol, that James Johnson in his commentary on the Psalms, he, he says that, the, the, the picture that, that they're painting is like trying to be drowned by an octopus. And just think of like ways to die. That would be a horrible way to go. Like, like you got two arms on you, you're able to break free, and maybe you break off the arms, but there's six more that can grab you and pull you down. David is saying, the cords of death entangled me, they pulled me down, but even though they did, and I was desperate, God was able to save me. And so as he reflects on God or Jesus as the source of his salvation, then, then as the psalm moves forward, what he does is he shifts into the power that God has. The, and as he, 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 he realizes the magnitude of the power of God, which really is the second beautiful reality that is ours in Christ. And it's that Jesus, that he's fierce. That he's, he's fierce. Look at what it says about God in, in verse 7. It says this, it says, The earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. He's saying that God has a power. That the reason why God's able to be the source of salvation is because of the power that he has. And, and part of his power is that he has the ability to shake mountains. Derek Kidner, in his commentary on Psalms, he, he sees this as, the, as, the, as David throwing back to the Exodus, reminding the people of the time where, a time where, where the people turned on God and God, God became so angry that the mountains literally shook. When I think of, of the mountains shaking, I think of it in comparison to myself and my own strength. I remember not that long ago that there was, this, there was like a tree in my front yard, and it had been dead for a couple of years, because that's how I do my chores. I wait a couple of years. And, <laughs> and it was probably like, I mean, it was like this big around. Like, it wasn't like anything spectacular. And so I called my dad to come out to help me, like, 
remove the tree. And we thought like we could do it on a Friday. It wouldn't be that big of a deal. We didn't have any tools. We just thought we'd be able to like rock it out. He, it was his idea, not mine. Um, and so we, and we got some shovel. We tried to do this thing. And eventually like, two hours later, we had to borrow a four-wheel four drive truck to pull it out of the ground. Like it was, it was, it was impossible. Like, by our own strength, we couldn't do anything about it. It, didn't ma- it wouldn't matter if we were angry. Like, there's nothing we could do to shake that tree out. And the picture here is of God, where it says, like, when God's angry, like, he can shake mountains. That you can't even pull out a tree. And so there's this power that's on display. And then, and then he has this next, this next line that I want to look at in, in verse 10. And it's one that, that with our, our, I think in our mind's eye, we don't see it as impressive as it is. And this is what he says in verse 10. It says, he rode on a cherub and flew he came swiftly on the wings of the wind. If you're like me, you don't think about cherubs a lot. If you do, don't tell me because I don't want to think you're the weirdest person. I just keep thinking about cherubs. But, but okay, but when, when you think, okay, in, in your mind's eye, what's the picture? Like I say cherub, you think, you probably think of an angel, maybe a little bit less fierce than Cupid, right? Like because Cupid's got an edge to him. But like, this is like a little bit more fierce. If, if you Google cherub, okay, this is the image that you see. That. I think we can all agree that there's nothing impressive about God riding on that. If anything, it's like kind of looks a little borderline child abuse. Like, what is he doing with those sweet little babies? He's like, I got one on each foot and he's flying like a hoverboard. I don't know. <coughs> But okay, so like that's what we think. We think cherub, that's what we think of. But in Ezekiel chapter one, it gives a different picture of what a cherub is. And I can tell you this, that ain't it. Look at, look at what it says. Look at what a cherub, has, how, how, how Ezekiel describes the cherub. As for the likeness of the living creatures, the cherub, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. If you put the cherub up picture up again, I think we can agree that there's something different between those two images, right? Like what it's saying is it's saying that God rides on these creatures that are basically fire that shoot lightning. And what you ride it says something about you. That what it's saying is he's saying he has that kind of power that he can ride that and dictate where it's supposed to go. That I can assure you that if one of those creatures were to walk into this room, none of us would think, I'm going to try to ride that. (laughs) All of us would think, how do I avoid the lightning and not die? But God's power is so real that he can ride it. And then as David is reflecting on the power of God, kind of looking at the end of his life, thinking about the victories that were before him, he realizes just the impressiveness of the natural wonders that that God performs every day. Look at this. It says, The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out, his hour, sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. That is, as David is looking at his victory that's before him. I mean, because his life is one that is, as he dies, like he's thinking about all the great things that that he has seen. And as he's thinking about all the great things that he's seen, and he's realizing the God that was working on his behalf, he becomes very aware that there is, that he, can't, he can't take credit for himself. That if that's who he is, if that's who God is, then you, you can't. Like, you can't say, well, look at what I did. <laughs> if anything, it's a, an incredibly humbling thing because you have to acknowledge 
the role that he must have played in the process if that's who he is. I, I, w- I would liken it to this, that in 1997, the Chicago Bulls won the, the, the NBA, NBA Finals, and there was a guy, like if he, if he were to be like, hey, you, you're, like a, you're a world champion, he would have to say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm the world champion because Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman, Phil Jackson, like I practiced against those guys, but I didn't really play much. Like, there's not much he can say to give himself much credit. And, and, and it's kind of the picture with, with us in our lives, especially with David, but also us, that when we consider how God goes before us, when we consider how God helps us, we've got to be really quick to acknowledge where the power comes from and the reason for the success that we have. It, and it's not us. And so David sees this, and he reminds us of this reality that's available to us in Christ, that he's fierce. And then as the psalm moves forward, we get to the verses that, that these are the verses that I really struggled with as I knew this was coming. Because I can't help but think of what I know about David. And and this is what David says in the middle of the psalm in verse 20. He says, The Lord dealt with me, and this is the end of his life, So this is the end. Like, this is after everything that's happened that we know about. The Lord dealt with me according to to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and I have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him, And I kept myself from my guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Three weeks ago, we we looked at Psalm 51. If you missed it, you should check out the podcast probably to get some context and maybe, or watch us on YouTube. But basically, Psalm 51 was David's response to the fact that he, he had an affair and he had someone murdered because he had an affair. And, I mean, it, and it was as bad as you would imagine. Like, that's on his, that, that, he's got to deal with that. That's on his record. And that's just one of the things that we happen to know. And if, knowing that, and then you see that, like, well, deal with me according to my righteousness? According to, the, like, how clean is his hands? <laughs> like, there's this, well, how do you, what do you do with that? I mean, and even David aside, okay, just David aside, let's just say like you're praying in church and you hear someone pray that next to you. Like even, like not David, but let's just say it's someone that looks nice. Like what are you going to think about that person when they pray that way? And because and, and it's because if all of us were honest and like, we would have to come to terms with the fact that based on our righteousness, based on the cleanness of our hands, no one can ask God to judge us on that basis. But yet David here, we know everything. He's able to say that. And this is why it's so important to realize what John Calvin says, that the psalm agrees far better with Jesus than it does with David. David's able to say this, and, and honestly, so are we. And it's because of the third reality that we see in the gospel in this psalm. And it's that Jesus steps in our place. <clears throat> that, that Jesus comes and, and steps in our place in such a way that we, we get credit for the life that he lived. Because that's, that's the only way that works. That if we, if we looked at our life, and we just thought of the totality of the things that we have done wrong, the idea of standing in the presence of a living God who's perfect in every way should horrify us. Because he's going to see things that no one else saw. He's going to be aware of motives that we were able to hide from everyone. He's aware of how wicked we are. 
And if we were to sincerely pray to him without Jesus, hey, judge me according to my righteousness, we would all be in trouble. But because of Jesus, that when you put your faith in him, part of what you're putting your faith in is that the day where you stand before God, you're able to say all of those things. And the reason why you're able to say all of those things isn't because you earned it, but it's because Jesus did. And you get credit for what Jesus did. In, in what world do you get credit for what someone else did to that level? That is the beauty of what's available to us in the gospel. That is why we put our faith in him. So you see that. And then the, the nice thing is that David does become a little bit more self-aware as the psalm moves on. You see this in verse 31. <clears throat> he says this. He says, For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. That so what David is saying <clears throat> is he's saying, I was victorious. Not because of me. Not because of the things that I've done. Not because of my, my, where I was born. Or, no, I, I was victorious because he equipped me. And, and, he sa- and then he says, and I'm blameless because he made me blameless. This is, this is his... And, and that's the only way that you can say that. I came across a quote from C.S. Lewis this week, and I thought it was really good. He, he says it this way, just talking about trying to be blameless. He says, no, no one knows how bad they are until they've tried very hard to be good. That we, we only have a shot if he's the one that does the work. And what David is showing us in this psalm is he's showing us that Jesus was willing to do the work, and he's showing us the scale of the work that Jesus did. And then finally we see, as we look at this psalm, we see that, that Jesus is victorious. That, that this is another part of the psalm that agrees far better with Christ, is that in Christ there is a victory that is, that is far greater than anything we could ever see. And the psalm ends with pointing us towards that victory. Look at this. He says, For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And that, that line there where he talks about even among the nations, part of what he's pointing to is he's pointing to the fact that there will come a day where God's going to save all the nations. That, that Paul, Paul talks about this in Romans 15. In Romans 15, he actually quotes this exact verse as his way of saying that, that, that God is now, he's, he's saving Gentiles. He's saving non-Jewish people, which would have been very difficult for Jewish people to come to terms with because part of their whole identity was wrapped up in the fact that they were God's chosen people. And, and here we see David pointing us forward to something that says, I will save all the nations. But this is one of the reasons why we, why we give to missions. It's because we, we know that it's not just about us. It's so easy to become fixated on what you're doing because it's all that you see. But that God has something in, pl- something like in store or in mind that is far greater than just this group of people right here or even this, this nation. The one of the things that I, I say a lot is that, that, that heaven, <clears throat> heaven is going to be the most diverse place of all. There are going to be people from all nations, all walks of life that are there. Because when Jesus came, he came in, in a way that would save all people who would put their faith in him. That Tim Keller says it this way, he says that, that in the gospel that you have the most inclusive of all the exclusive religions. That Jesus will save anyone that's willing to come to him and put their faith in him. That, that, that David, he's pointing us to that 
And he's also pointing us to Jesus' kingdom. And he says this, he says, to David and his offspring forever. Now, we didn't, in this kind of study of David, we didn't talk a lot about his sons, um, because we just didn't have time. But that phrase, like, offspring, like, a lot of people look at their kids with rose-colored glasses. Like, this is something that David wouldn't have really been able to do. His oldest son was a man named Amnon, and he had an incestuous relationship with his sister, and he was killed for it. You got Absalom, who tried to usurp David from the throne and died for it. You got Solomon, who, who's decent, but like his kind of claim to fame at the end of his life was that he had thousands of wives and concubines. And so as David is, and then the, he had other sons, but the Bible didn't think they were very interesting, so he didn't put much information about them in there. So, so David's talking about how his offspring, or like there's someone from his offspring that's going to be on the throne forever. He's got to be writing that thinking, well, surely we're going to skip a generation. <laughs> It can't be these fools. And, and, and it, it really it just it gets worse. And this is one of the reasons why the gospel writer Matthew goes to great lengths to show that Jesus was in the line of David. Because the, one of David's offspring does sit on the throne forever. And it's Jesus. That, that Jesus is the one who's actually able to fulfill what David is talking about there. That, that he will reign and he will do so forever. But even for us, like there's this challenge right now in our own like context because he, I mean, there's not a descendant of Jesus on the throne right now. I mean, the queen of England, like she's not like related to Jesus. And, and so the question is, okay, so what is he, what is, what is he talking about? He's talking about the kingdom that we're all part of in Christ. That in Christ, we're part of a group where Jesus is our king. And, and what we're trusting in is that though we might not see him right now, that someday he will reign forever. And, and that when he does, like we're believing that it's going to be so great that we won't need an election every four years. That there will be no vigilantes who are going to try to overthrow him, but everyone is going to be so, so pleased with his rule. And we get tastes of it now, we get glimpses of it here and there, but the day will come where he will truly be our king. And he'll reign forever, just like David said that he would. And for me, if I think of the heart of David's life, the heart of like, this whole like, end of his life reflection, I personally can't help but think it's verses 31 and 32. Because we know David was flawed. Like, we, we know that he had, he had a story. I don't know if any of us would let him watch our kids. But when he would fall, he knew where to look. He says, the God, and he knew where to look because he knew him. He knew God. He knew that God was the one who equipped him with strength and made his way blameless. That's his story, and that can be your story too. He wants to equip you with strength. He wants to go before you in your life. He wants to give you the ability to, to do things that, that only you can do through him. He can do that. And he, he wants to make your way blameless, but you have to be willing to put your trust and your faith in him. And if you do, that's your reality. But if not, then you'll have to stand before him without him. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we love you. And God, we thank you for your grace. God, we thank you for how you help us and how you work on our behalf. And God, even just the beautiful realities that are available to us in Christ. God, that you're the source of our salvation. You're, you're vicious and strong. God, that you, you stand in our place. And God, you, you're, you're victorious. You're going to win. And I pray that, God, that the gospel would wash over our hearts in such a way that we would evaluate our lives. Why do we think we're right? 
Why do we think we're blameless? Why do we think we have a chance? And God, if that answer is anything that isn't Jesus Christ, I pray by faith that we would repent of our sins and we'd put our hope in Jesus and his ability to make us blameless. God, you know what everyone's carrying in here, but I know that you have the power to remove weights from hearts. You have the power to bring hope where there's hopelessness. And God, you have the ability to save those who are lost. And so God, we come to you this morning praying that you would. Praying that you would work powerfully on our behalf. And God, as you do, aware of who you are, we will give you all the credit and all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you for watching us on YouTube today. We hope that the content that you heard helped you know Jesus better. Also, don't forget to click subscribe and to click the bell icon so that you'll get notified every time our channel drops a new video. If you would like to partner with us and what God is doing here at New Life, there are three ways that you can give. You can give by mailing a check to the church. You can give by going to giving.nlspringfield.com or you can text 84321 with the amount that you'd like to give. And if you would like to connect with us in any other way, you can visit us at nlspringfield.com, click on the connect tab, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. See you next week.